Hi everybody, continuing the previous lecture, let us try to interpret what are the operators Psi, Psi Dagger and the product of both Psi Dagger and Psi. We will use the fermionic fields for an electron or for, for non-relativistic electron. Just continuing what we, we did in the previous lecture, but just to remember, for a classical field describing the electron in quantum mechanics, there is a probability amplitude, which is the wave function, okay? And the probability amplitude, when you take the squared modulus of, of that amplitude, it produces a probability density dis distribution, okay? And of course, if you integrate out over, over all space, over the volume of space in three dimensions, I am using three dimensions here, it, it produces one because the probability of finding one electron everywhere in space must be equal to one. So for the probability of finding the electron at some point near, near the position R in space is equal to the probability density times the infinitesimal volume around that point, okay? And uh, when we second quantize the field, we have in, in place of Psi, replacing Psi, we have a field Psi in, in, in replacement of the probability density, we have an operator because both Psi and Psi Dagger are operators. And of course, this integral, which is for a classical field, uh, normalized to unity because of the probabilistic interpretation. Now, what is it? So we need to interpre interpret the meaning of these things. So the present lecture will be focused on interpreting Psi, Psi Dagger, and the product of these two operators here. So, but first let me address another issue here because in quantum fields it is commonplace to switch from a discrete to a continuous and vice versa. So is commonplace in quantum fields. So there are discrete representations and continuum representations. And how do we get the continuum from the discrete or vice versa? Okay, so let me just remember that in the previous lecture, we normalized the wave function according to something like this. The psi of R and T, is equal to 1 over the square root of n. It was considering a discrete space. This n must be in, in the position basis, so we have, in, sorry, in momentum basis. So we sum over all the k's, the, the wave vectors, which are discrete in the in, in this space. So there are just a a set of k's, k1, k2, they are countable, they are numerable, okay, so there is a, it can be infinite, but, but it's discrete for now. So you sum over all the k's, all the spins, a c which annihilates in an electron in this case, but it could be any other field, uh, any other particle, if you were working with other particles, e to the i k dot r minus omega times t. Remember that k times the h bar is just momentum and h bar times omega is just the energy of the particle, which is a function of the momentum given because there is a there's dispersion relation and for for our particular case, for the electrons, we saw previously that this is corresponding to momentum squared divided by twice mass, all right? In, in this particular case, in this case. 
but it could be anything else, okay? So you have anything. It is a discretion relation for the relation uh, between momentum and energy. And we normalize the wave function using this square root of n. But just remember that this wave function here just corresponds to it's an operator, but just corresponds to to a, a, a field, a cat, sorry, a, a cat. If you if you forget about being an operator, it would be a cat uh, projected out to the position basis, of course. And this cat projected out to the position basis is 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 being taken in a discrete in a discrete Hilbert space. So usually we have three dimensions x, y, and z. Right? You you could have two dimensions or just one dimension, but suppose you discretize the x-axis, which has some length L of x, which corresponds to some number of points times delta x. So this delta x is just the infinitesimal separation between discrete points in a lattice. So I have here some x, j point, and I can do the same for the y axis, okay? I can do the same for the z axis, and this produces a grid in three dimensions. So you have at any combination of points, a point in this three-dimensional volume, all right? So there is a delta z, there is a delta y, and of course, the LZ is equal to the number of points in Z times the delta Z. The number of points is from the most negative Z to the, plus, the more positive. It could be eventually infinite, but usually you discretize and you just restrict your space to some finite minimum to a finite maximum value the same for x and y and of course the l y is just the delta y times the n y so of course if you take the limit you have a volume the total number of points in this grid it could be it could be kx ky and kz it could be a momentum space all right i am just writing here the position space so there is a xj point, a yk, and a zl point, and the combination of three of these coordinates produces a point in this space. This forms a lattice, okay? So this is a lattice. So it is a quantum field theory in a lattice. And uh, the total number of points, of course, in this grid will be nx times ny times nz. Okay, this can be a very large number in three dimensions. Of course, if you have if you have just two dimensions, it is n y n x, and if you have one dimensions, you you, you just need the x axis here. All right. So uh, when you replace something like let me let me just remember you a little things. Remember that. When you are working with discrete, in, suppose just one dimension here, discrete in the position space, this corresponds a Kronecker delta. But when you go to a continuum, when you go to a continuum, what you need to do, you replace the Kronecker delta by a Dirac delta, but it comes from renormalizing the x j vector to xj over the square root of some delta x, which is the spacing between points, all right? And um, 
while you use some one over the square root of n for a discrete space and you zoom over all the all the vectors supposing position space r here you are zooming over all the x y and z which are discrete x y and z i will put some sub indices here just to, to remember that they are discrete in the discrete sense here you zoom over all the xj's all the yl's and all the zk's or sorry i, I wrote there uh, yk and zl you zoom over all all the points in the three dimensions so this is a three dimensional zoom it's one over the square root of n zoom of all the x all the y's and all the z's okay what you need to do to go for to, from this thing here to a continuum what you need to replace okay so remember that the wave functions the cats will be renormalized by the square root of x delta x so in this case remembering that your wave function which in in the discrete case will, would be x j projected out to the psi state the psi state here you need to renormalize all the things by some delta x you need to divide it by some some delta x delta y delta z and you replace the summations by integrals so in this case you need to replace n by nx delta x it comes from from the wave functions okay delta y delta z okay you need to replace this of course you have nx delta x ny delta y and z delta z because you have the square root of n which is a product in the three dimensional space and the summation is replaced by an integral okay so this is just notice this is just the lx this is just the ly this is just the lz okay so you have a product of three lengths which are orthogonal this is just the volume the product of these things is just the volume in real space all right other normalization factors can emerge depending on how you define the fields but usually when going from the discrete to the continuum you just need to if you are zooming over position i'll i'll use this convention here with the sub index j for all the points one over the square root of n in the r space in the position space okay so this just n here okay you go to a continuum by replacing the summation by an integral and normalization factors by one of the square root of volume for wave functions okay so this is usually what you need to do and of course if you have a summation over k you have a number of k vectors here you need to replace it by some square root of the volume but in k space not in real space so you will integrate over d3k and this d3r here is just remember the x dy dz and of course d3k is just dkx dky dkz of course you could multiply everything by h bar here and you need to divide by h bar and you arrive with momentum but you can you can use that uh, that that h bar which appears here if you use momentum is equal to h bar k you can use it to renormalize or to redefine the units of your wave function okay well this is the replacements you need usually to do but 
just remember that for a length L X, the minimum in the discrete in the discrete world, the minimum delta K X corresponds to two pi divided by L X. All right. So when you when you renormalize the when you renormalize the, the square root of n to a continuum, usually you need to to have some some n k x times delta k x n k y times delta k y and so on and so forth. So you'll arrive with something like a 2 pi to the d dimensions divided by the volume at d dimensions, OK? So the volume in the k space is just the inverse of the volume in the real space. And it's normalized by some two pi factors, which which you could eventually reinsert into the definition of your wave functions of your amplitudes. Okay, but you can go from a discrete world to a continuum, and from a continuum to discrete, just changing integrals by summations or, or vice versa. Of course, there are important important results which I need to remember you. One over n. If you divide it by divide by the total number of points and you sum over all the position or momentum, it could be momentum here. Okay, all the position vectors R j over all the R j. You assume the exponential of i, it could, it could be plus or minus here, k minus some k primed here, dot rj. This produces a discrete delta, which is the Kronecker delta. So it is one if k is equal to k primed, and it is zero if, he, if you have k distinct from k prime. It is a vector equality, all right? All the components must be equal for this delta b1. And this relation in the continuum, this relation in the continuum is replaced by 1 over 2 pi to the d dimensions. If you have three dimensions, it's a 3. If you have two dimensions, 2. The integral over the whole volume of space, let me use here r position, but it could be, it, you can switch r minus r prime k, j, k, j, and this will be a delta in position, all right? So there are just variables here. And if I integrate over the d-dimensional volume, suppose a three-dimensional volume, so this d is the number of space dimensions, OK? If you integrate i to the plus or minus, whatever, k minus k primed dot r, integrating over all the variables here, you'll find out a d-dimensional Dirac delta, which is equal to the d-dimensional Dirac delta of, sorry, k minus k primed. OK, so if here, if the vectors are equal, you have infinity. You have the, an infinite, a divergent result. So k is equal to k primed. If the argument here is zero, which means k equals to k primed, you have infinite. If they are distinct, you get zero. So this is the definition of a Dirac delta. Okay. So in, in this case, if you plot it 
I'm using a vector convention here. I would need three axes or two axes or whatever, but I'm just historically representing this thing here. And the delta, if you have a k prime equal to k, in this point, you have one, okay? And to any other points, because they are discrete here, you get zeros, okay? So you have a one here, a one in this point and zeros otherwise. And in this case here, if you have the components of the k vector at k primed, okay, at k primed, you have infinite, otherwise you have zeros for this delta function. Well, uh, this is this is pretty obvious, I guess, but it's it's worth to mention. It is worth to mention a little of these things, which will appear quite frequently, quite often, when dealing with, with field theories. Now, let us try to interpret the field. Let us try to interpret a psi dagger. All right. So, what is it is easy to start with the psi dagger. So what is the meaning of psi dagger? What it really it really does in a state, right? So since this is an operator, it must operate on something, on some state in the Hilbert space. So let us define the true vacuum, a true vacuum, okay? True vacuum zero if you apply any annihilation operator to that with a given momentum and spin, it could be other, other quantum numbers which you would be using. If you apply this to the vacuum, you get the null vector for all the k's and all the spins. There are no particles at all. A true vacuum is the absence of particles in any state. There are no particles, all right? So this is it. So remember that psi of r and t is just 1 over the square root of n. This n is the total number of, of points in k space, but I will use the same number for momentum and position, just not to be confused with that. And I need to sum all the k vectors, and I need to sum all the spins c of k and the spin sigma. Just to be complete here, I will use to write a Pauli spinner for the spin half particle, which is the electron. I am using as an example the electron field. And it is, the psi is i k dot r minus omega t. Just remember that energy, it is worth pointing that out. Just remember, omega is energy and k is momentum. Okay, so all these spinners for spin half particles is, is used in quantum fields. It's just a different notation for these vectors, one and zero for the up state corresponding to the z axis or to some quantization axis. And zero, one is the down state. Okay, and if you perform a dagger of the spin primed with a spin sigma, sigma prime sigma, you can just up or down here, up or down here, you'll have a Kronecker delta for spins, okay, because they are orthogonal states. So this is the same as using this convention, this is the same as using this convention, okay. So the complete basis corresponds if this equation is the same as writing it as sigma, sigma, Sigma prime sigma. This is equal to this 
notation here is a Dirac delta because you have the orthonormality of a given basis, all right? So when you apply the psi to a vacuum at any given position, at any given instant of time, I don't need to worry about the instant of time here, what I will get, since this object here op operates on the true vacuum, it produces zero for any state. So this annihilates the vacuum. So this psi here is an annihilation operator. It has the same action as the annihilation operators. It is composed of annihilation operators. So this is some kind of annihilation operator. Okay, I can identify this at first because the definition of the annihilation operator is that when acting on a true vacuum, it produces the null vector. All right, so this is a zero vector. So this operator, no matter what point it is applied, just remember this operator is acting on the position R and the time at time t, and this produces nothing when applied to a true vacuum. All right, so this is for the annihilation operator. But now let us turn our attention to the psi dagger here. Okay, so I will use the dagger here. I just need to put a dagger here, a dagger here. This is just a number and change sign of the imaginary unit here. So this is the dagger operator. I already know that the psi annihilates the vacuum because it is composed of a superposition of annihilation operators. Keep that in mind, okay? Keep that in mind. In a previous lecture, I, on purpose, omitted the spinners. It, it usually doesn't matter. You, you could make them implicit. You don't need to write it here, but for the sake of completeness here, uh, in notation, let me insert this, the Pauli spinners, all right? So what does this object do for the vacuum state, all right? When I apply the dagger, the psi dagger, what, what does produces to the vacuum? So psi dagger of R and T applied to a vacuum produces some state psi, all right? Which is not the vacuum, probably. It is another state psi, okay? So what is this state? That's what I am trying to solve, all right? And to do that, for the sake of simplicity, let us assume t equal to zero. All right, this instant of time. What does the action of psi dagger do for the vacuum? What is this state? All right, that, that's the, the question here. What is the meaning of psi dagger? So let me rewrite this equation here. So I have a psi dagger at t equal to zero, so I will omit the time here. I am inserting time t equals to zero. And this is the summation that I apply it to a vacuum. It is a summation, one over the square root of n, a double summation. As a matter of fact, it is a summation over spins and it is a summation over kx, ky, and kz. And this is just a three-dimensional sum but I will use just a single summation symbol here. I need to sum over all the k's and all the sigmas. C dagger, this is an operator, k sigma. A spinner, k, q dagger, sigma, all right? Which usually we can omit. Exponential of minus i k dot r and the Temporal part 
is omitted because time t is equal to zero. So this is t equal to zero here, t equal to zero. All right? And this is applied to the vacuum. So when you apply that to a vacuum, I need to remember from the algebra, creation operators acting on a vacuum, no matter the quantum numbers are, okay, creates a particle at the J state. All right? So when acting on a vacuum, it could be for bosons, because for vacuum, if you apply a fermionic, and I am not, I'm not commuting anything, I'm just having linear operations here, I don't have products of operators. When acting on a vacuum for bosons or fermions, the result is the same. So at this point, it doesn't matter if I am dealing with bosons or fermions, but Whatever, whenever is necessary, I will, I will consider the case of fermionic states because I am just continuing the previous lecture where we started with the, the electron field as an example here. But the interpretations of the psi dagger psi, the psi operator, the psi dagger operator is the same for bosons and for fermions, okay? So this is exactly this, the same interpretation here. So in this case, we have a state, a psi state, all right, which corresponds to this psi dagger of R. This is the state at time t equal to zero, applied to a vacuum, all right? Applied to a vacuum. I don't know what is this state, I don't know what it is now, but I can divide it by the square root of n, and I have a summation of k over all the k's and all the spins. I have spinors here, which I can, just to make things simpler, I use here e to the minus i k dot r, which is just a number here, a complex number. And when this acts on this thing here, I create a particle, which is one particle. I could write it as the state of one particle at k sigma, okay? I could write it that way, but just to make things simpler, since I have only one particle, if the state is occupied, I will write down this state as the following convention, okay? So K sigma means that this state is occupied by one particle with wave vector K and spin sigma, all right? So this is the action of this operator to the vacuum. So now let me just project out into the position basis, all right? Let me project this state into the position basis. So, but I'm not using the same R here. I need to use another, another R here, okay? Because I want to see what the action produces at other spaces of, other positions of space. Since this is acting on R, I am trying to see what is this state when represented at some R, R prime here, okay? And therefore, I am calculating the probability of finding the state R with spin, with a given spin, suppose the same spin, sigma, well, I can use the sigma prime here, and I can sum over all these states of spin and divide by half, so I'm not worried about spin. So I'm projecting out this thing here, the position basis, okay? So what we have, the position cat, the bra, the bra, sorry, the bra of the position at our prime, the psi dagger, which is an operator operating on the vacuum, which is the same as one over the square root of n, a summation over k and sigma. So let me just replace this. 
let me just replace by sigma prime. I want to see if there is something at some position r prime with spin sigma primed. So I am projecting out with r primed and sigma primed the action of this operator here on the vacuum. Okay, and I, I find out this is i minus i k dot r and the projection of r primed sigma primed with k sigma, all right? So I need to evaluate this thing here, but remember this is just a coefficient and any state, any given state of momentum and spin can be factorized. We already used that fact. This, the spatial portion of the wave function or the orbital quantum numbers can be factorized from the spin quantum numbers. And in this way, this projection here, okay, I'll, I will just erase the board here. This projection here, R prime, sigma prime with K sigma is just a delta because it's the sigma prime bra projected out to the sigma cat. This produces a, a Kronecker delta. The spins must be equal. Okay, so a Kronecker delta. And um, in the end, I need to evaluate this thing here, R prime with K. But remember, this is just the coefficients for a basis transformation, transforming momentum to position. And in three-dimensional cases, it is just the following. Exponential of i k dot r prime, all right, this is this object here, divided by the square root of n, because I need some normalization and this the same for the plane waves in the discrete sense. Okay, so it's divided by the square root of n. Okay. Now, if we insert the result here, what we have, we have that r primed, sigma primed, projected onto the action of the dagger operator at time t equal to zero. All right. That for that. For, for for that matter, we are just omitting time here because we are acting on the vacuum state at time t equal to zero. And what we have, notice that I already have a square root of n here and another square root of n will, will be present because of this factor here and therefore we have one of over n. 1 over n. The summation goes, runs over all the k states, over all the spin states, a delta sigma sigma prime, okay? An exponential which is already there, and this exponential which comes from this factor here, so i k minus a k, k appears both, both terms, so R primed minus R, okay, and there is a dot product, okay, because we are replacing this factor here, we are replacing this factor here by delta sigma sigma prime divided by the square root of n, the exponential of i to the k dot R prime, all right? So when you insert that, you can merge the factors into a single exponential and you'll find out i to the k dot r primed minus r. Or you can reverse the sign because it doesn't matter in this case. You could, you could write it as a minus here and switch the prime, switch the places of the prime factor. It doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't matter. For the, the final result, it doesn't matter. So, when zooming over the spins, 
Remember, I zoom over up and down. I can choose up or down here. And therefore, this result is 1. Because if I pick up the up spin, I want to see if the particle created is up. OK. There will be a summation which runs from up to down. And if this is up, at some point, this is will this will be up, so this is 1. If I choose here a down state, at some point this sigma will be down and this is 1. So this factor is removed from the summation. The summation produces a 1. So summation over spins of delta sigma sigma prime is equal to 1, is equal to unity. And in this way, we have 1 over n summation over k exponential of minus i k dot r minus r prime. All right. So remember this summation is equal to one and this is summation over spins, which just is factored out. So this is the product of two summations over spin because this term is it can be factorized. And this is just for the for the for the case of a discrete lattice is just delta of r r prime. Just remember that Kronecker deltas are symmetric under permutation of indices. Okay, so the the Kronecker delta is symmetric, and the Dirac delta is if you switch. The sign of the argument, if you change, if you insert a minus, so minus x, minus minus plus x prime, the delta is, is the same. It's, it is an even function, okay? So they are, they are symmetric under a change of sign here. They are even functions. All right, so this is for discrete. So no matter if you had a plus here, if you switch places here, but the result is just a delta of r r prime and just remember what is what from where this comes from from the projection of r prime with r so in this case what we are doing we are doing when operating with this state this this operator on the vacuum we are creating a psi which is r okay no matter the spin all right it is a combination it, it doesn't matter the spin you are just creating a state with a particle at the position r so the action of psi dagger to a vacuum produces a state psi, and this state psi is equal to a position eigenvector. All right? If you consider for particles in quantum mechanics, there is an operator for position, and this is a position eigenstate with eigenvalue r, r prime, sorry, because. This is a delta r, r, r prime. So this state is a state r. Sorry, no, r, right? Because r prime is what I projected out here. So r prime projected to r produces this delta, the Kronecker delta in the discrete sense. Of course, if you were dealing with the continuum, which is perhaps the most interesting situation, you would replace this by an integral and the renormalization factor would be another one here, but you find out the Dirac delta in, in replacement for the Kronecker delta, but no matter what, for, for this bit, it is the following relation for this bit, if it would be a continuum, so this is for discrete, 
for a continuum, this summation would produce a Dirac delta over d dimensions. But this is just a continuum result. Okay. So what this operator really mean? It is a creation operator. And what state it creates? It creates a particle at the position r at time t equals to zero. So psi dagger is our goal was to identify psi dagger. So psi dagger creates a state. So suppose for zero here, it creates a state R, okay, which which means it creates a particle at position R at T equal to zero in this case with 100% certainty. So it is a creation operator in the position basis. All right, you could say that way. All right, so this is a creation operator. Now we already know that psi of R and T is annihilation. Position space or position basis, and psi dagger is a creation operator in the position space. The same, but this creation operator is a creator, right? Well, uh, of course, you can represent your your field, you can use any basis. So, psi of R and T, this is the annihilation operator, would be produced by the sum over some n integers, perhaps orbital, uh, atomic orbitals, or whatever, a set of quantum numbers, suppose n, l, m and sigma, so you would have orbitals n, l, m, sigma of position r, and creation operators in, in place of k vector, which is a momentum eigen, eigenvalue, you would be creating a par, uh, annihilating, sorry, a particle at the quantum numbers n, l, m, sigma. Or whatever, you could choose anything here, any kind of basis functions. So a complete set of basis functions, depending on some set of labels and spin, of course, the spin of the particle. And the result would be the same. Okay, The result would be interpreted the same way. Okay, Because this is a complete set. But we are just using the most uh, easy and, and perhaps the more interesting case, which is expanding the field in terms of plane waves. Okay, for free particles, plane waves are just eigenfunctions of the classical field, of the classical field operator. Okay, so plane waves will do a great job in, in many, many scenarios. But some, some problems will require the usage of perhaps atomic orbitals, molecular orbitals, or, or something else, some other basis. Now we need to interpret what is this operator, which is a function of position and time eventually, which is just the product of psi of r and t dagger 
times psi of r and t, right? This is the operator. What is this operator now? And to do that, we just integrate over space, okay? Over space. We are integrating this operator over the entire space. So, but, but because uh, we are dealing with a, well, as, as things goes forward here, I will, I will replace the, the continuum by a discrete, discrete representation. But remember, this thing here, for a classical field, it will be proportional to the integral of modulus squared of the field over the entire volume of space, it will be one. So probability of finding a single particle everywhere is one. There is a particle there. Okay, so what is this operator, which is the analogous? Well, let us integrate over D3R, which in the case of a discrete space, we just need to replace it by a sum summation over the whole position space. I am replacing the volume integration by summation over all the positions of space. Okay. I am not using any sub index here because I am saying that is to be interpreted as discrete, but if the result, the final result, would not depend on that, okay? So it's independent of, of the discrete or continuous situation. And we need to sum over all the positions at time t. You could, you could do that for time t equal to zero at, or any other instant of time. It is very general, but it is for free particles a constant of motion. So I, I will use time t equal to zero, right? The, the same instant of time, I will use time t equal to zero. So let us evaluate this at zero. We already know there are no interactions, the probabilities modulus squared of the fields will not change, but if you can, if you can, if you if you want, you can do it using any given instant of time, not zero, and the result will be the same also in this case. So we are replacing the integral by a summation, and we're replacing time t by zero. So I need to replace this field here. So it's one over the square root of n. I am writing this field here. So let me use some colors here. Perhaps it, it makes it more, more detectical. So the psi dagger of R and T and the psi of R and T, T equal to zero. We are setting time equal to zero. So I'm writing here in red, the dagger field, so we have a summation over k and sigma, c dagger over k and sigma, all right? I need to remember there is a spinner for the spin sigma here, and this comes with a phase factor, which is the k dot r with a minus, all right? So this is for the creation operator. So I need also to write expanded in terms of wave of plane waves expanded you could use another complete basis a summation over n over over k of course one over n one over the square root of n this is just a normalization remember it would be here some term like omega k times t plus omega k times t but t is equal to zero and because a Dirac delta or a Kronecker delta, according to the case, is continuous or discrete, discrete system, uh, the energies must be equal in the end, and the time will.
vanish out in this case. So I'm doing a time t equal to zero. In summation over some other label, you need to replace. You cannot use the same dummy label because it's been summed over here, replaced by k primed, sigma primed. This is a key, a key dagger here, is the Pauli spin or dagger for sigma spin. And here we have annihilation operator at k sigma prime, k prime sigma prime, all right? So the primed factors here, k prime sigma prime, right? This is an operator, of course. And here we have a key primed spinner. This is a row, this is a column. They multiply each other. You will have already a Kronecker delta. And here there is a phase factor which comes from the plane wave expansion. So K primed dot R, okay? So the K is primed. But the R is the same because this is the R, this is the same position in space. Now you can just do the calculations. So remember that key dagger sigma primed key sigma is one only if you have both spins equal. So you have a summation over R. This 1 over square root of n, 1 over the square root of n, I can replace here, I can put in front of all the equation 1 over n, a summation over r, which is already there, a summation over k and sigma, a summation over k primed and sigma primed, all right, a Kronecker delta, because I multiply these things here, so a Kronecker delta for the spins. A product of two operators. This comes from the Psi dagger, so this is a dagger operator. And this comes from the annihilation operator, so K primed sigma, all right? This is it. And we have four, we have Three summations here, three summations here, three summations here, plus one here, plus one here. You have a lot of indices, as a matter of fact. But you can use you can use smart smartly some results here, and you can multiply this exponential by that and merge them into a single exponential. So you will have an imaginary factor, a k primed minus a k factor dot a position r okay so you have that now notice that the only thing depending on position is this exponential here and this exponential when summed over all the r's is just the definition one over n the summation over the, all the positions of this exponential here dot r is just the delta of k primed k, all right, in the discrete case. If continuum, integral, it will be an integral over the volume, this one over the square root of n would be counterbalanced by something else in the normalization of the functions. You would have a one over two pi factor here to the d dimensions and this would be a Dirac delta, okay? But you would be integrating over some other indices there also. But let us use the discrete case here. And now we have that the integral over the entire volume of psi dagger of R and T, psi of R and T. I am using T equal to zero, but it could be anything, as I said previously. We have a summation over k sigma, a summation over k primed sigma primed, 
a Dirac delta, a Kronecker delta in the case of spin is always discrete, but in the case of momentum, this exponential, this summation, this, this whole part here is removed, removed, this thing here is removed because I'm using this fact and this produces a delta of k, k primed, all right? And this product here of creation and annihilation operators. But what, what deltas, Kronecker deltas, do in summation? They only replace labels and eliminate some summations. Because this is everywhere zero except for when sigma prime is equal to sigma. So if you fix the sigmas and you run sigma prime from all the from the the first value to the last one, at some point the sigma prime will be equal to sigma, and only at that point is this Kronecker is one. So you just eliminate the summation over sigma prime and replace sigma prime by sigma. And they, they can be up or downs here because they are spins. Also for the vector notation here, you can fix the, the k vector here, this summation you will, you will perform in the end, and you run all the values of k primed, but this delta is just one when k primed is equal to k, otherwise it is zero. So you replace this by one and replace k prime by k and remove the summation. So when calculating the summations, you just need to eliminate this thing here, eliminate the deltas, but the deltas imply k primed, you need to replace by k. Sigma primed, you need to replace by sigma. And that summation, in the end, you cannot do anything else. So the integral of this operator, which we mapped to a discrete case, produces nothing else but the summation over k and sigma, c dagger over all the k sigma, c over the same k, the same sigma. All right, because I am replacing k prime and sigma prime by k sigma. And remember, this is a number operator. So number operator and k sigma is just equal to the product of the creation operator times the annihilation operator. So this is a number operator. So this is a sum over all number operators. And this is a total number operator because it sums, it runs from all the possible indices, which the particular specific number operators can take. All right? So this is number operator for a given k sigma. If you sum over all the possible states k and all the possible spins, you have a total number operator. So what is this? Now we can interpret this thing. So the integral over the entire volume of space at a given instant of time of this object, which is the creation times the annihilation operator integrated over the entire space are the, the three dimensions, but it could be two dimensions or whatever, is just equal to the summation of operators, the 
specific, the particular operators acting on subspaces, on sub, substates of K sigma, and this is a total number operator. This is a number operator. So we asked, what is the replacement by for, sorry, for the integral over the probability density, which produces one in a classical field describing the electron? It is the number operator. It, be, it became an operator. It counts all the particles. Because suppose the following. You have a state in Fox space. You have a state psi which has one particle at some k1 with some spin sigma 1, one particle at some k2, some spin sigma 2, and zero particles in all the other states. Okay, You have just this thing here. When you apply this, so you have one particle at this state, one particle at this state. When you apply this, when you apply the number to the psi, you will have a summation runs over all the possible values here, and it picks one and repeats the state for the state k1, because there is a nk1 sigma 1 here. So it just counts the number of particles in that state. So k1 sigma 1, 1 k2 sigma 2. It, it doesn't change the numbers of particles, so zeros plus. There is an operator n of k2 sigma 2 applied to this state. It counts that number of particles in this state, which is 1. So, and the state is repeated. 1 in the state k2 sigma 2, all right? And zeros otherwise. So there are the operators acting on all the other possible k3 sigma 3, k4 sigma 4, if countable, because if you are dealing with the discrete, it, it can be counted. But there are no particles in the other states, so the number of operators produces zero. So this is the same as this one, but I have one plus one. I have two, which is the eigenvalue. There are two particles. It produces a two. One particle in the state k1, sigma 1, one particle in the state k2, sigma 2 zero particles otherwise. So this is the total number operator. Okay. And for free particles, it is, for free particles, it is a conserved quantity for free field. and is conserved, okay? And is conserved for free particles. Of course, this operator here, psi dagger times psi, at a given instant of time, is just a particle density operator. Or just density operator or number number density operator okay you you can choose whatever do you want to name that but it's a density operator when you integrate out the density operator over the entire space you get the total number and this which is distinct if this is distinct from the case of a classical field, it can assume any integer value, even for fermions, for bosons and for fermions. What you really need to do for fermions is that a given state only for fermions, it can have only one or zero particle. But I can put one more fermion in another state. Okay, so a K2 sigma 2. And I can put uh, one more fermion at a third state, okay? 
I cannot do for fermions is to put two particles in this state, this, this, this particular state, or two particles here or here. But I can choose zero or, or one for any given state. And the sum of total number of electrons or fermions is given by this operator. This is a total operator, total number operator. Okay? Of course, for bosons, if, if, if you were dealing with bosons, no problem here dealing with bosons. The result would be the same. But for bosons, you could put two or three or four particles in this state and more particles in this state, more particles in that state, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this answers the question. We have interpreted all the actions of psi, psi dagger, and this operator, which can be integrated. So the integral of this operator produces a number operator, a total number operator, which is just the sum over all the quantum states allowed uh, of number operators, which can always be expressed as the product of a dagger operator times a annihilation operator. So creation times annihilation operators here. And this is the annihilation In, in R, in the space of position, in the position space, in the position basis, and this is the creation in R, okay? And this is a density operator, in this case, a particle density operator. So, if you, if you think a little bit, you can see that a classical particle is represented in quantum mechanics by a field, the procedure of replacing functions by operators for momentum and position and all the classical physical operators is called the first quantization procedure. So you have a particle which is first quantized. It is described by a classical field. And when you quantize this field, you have quantum fields whose quanta can be interpreted as particles. You, by means of field quantization in the canonical quantization procedure, these operator fields create quanta of Energy eigenstates, momentum eigenstates, atomic orbital eigenstates, they create annihilate particles. So these fields create or annihilate or measure the number of occupation of given states. These states are single particle states in this case here. And you, for fermions, you can put one fermion or no fermion or zero at each quantum state. So you you have classical particles, you first quantize it, you have a, a classical field description, but this field modulus squared is perhaps uh, interpreted, as, interpreted as a probabilistic distribution or density. And when you transform this fields into operators, they act on states, on vacuum, on any given state, and the action is create or annihilate quanta of the field. And these quanta are interpreted again as particles. So there is a duality here, okay? But uh, there are, of course, other fields which are in classical physics already fields. For instance, the electromagnetic fields. When you quantize it, you arrive at the concept of photons. There are sound waves. When, when you quantize the sound waves, you arrive at the concept of phonons. But in this case,
case, the ideas, usually the ideas are the same. There are annihilation operators in space. There are creation operators in space, which create a, quanta at a, given, a quantum at a given position of space at a given instant of time. And you have total number of particles. Make the fields interact in the first quantization if the probabilistic wave function is integrated out, you have a probability of one. And at some point of space, a particle surely will be there in first quantization. OK? But now, if we will see it in next lectures, if you make the fields interact, you can make particles disappear and other particles to be created. Of course, always conserving the electric charge, energy, momentum, and all that. You need to conserve all the classical quantities which were already conserved in classical physics. But now you, you, you can have a particle, and at some instant of time, it can interact and be absorbed by something, annihilated. And another particle of another kind will be created, perhaps. Okay. So for non-interacting fields, for free fields, this number operator for a given type of particle, of course, is conserved. But if you make the particles interact with each other, perhaps the numbers are non are, are a non-conserved quantity because one particle can be converted into something else. Okay. For instance. To, to pick up a, a very, very familiar example, if you have an electron, it can collide with the positron, and they annihilate each other. There are other processes they scatter, but suppose it's an annihilation process, something, helped, ha, ha, some, something happy, happens here, and in the end, two photons emerge. So if you think about a situation where no photons are present and two par charged particles are present, in the beginning, you have one electron, one positron. In the end, no electron, no positron. The number of particles is non-conserved quantity. But there were no photons in the start of the process. Now you have one photon, another photon, just, just carrying the energy and momentum of the original particles here, but no electric charge. Zero charge for this photon, zero charge for this photon. OK, charge conservation is ensured because globally you have here zero charge. One plus charge, one minus charge, zero charge in the end, zero charge for the whole system. So charge is conserved, energy momentum is conserved, but the number of a given kind of particle, positron or electron or photon, is a non-conserved quantity when you make them to interact. All right? In the next lecture, we need to find out how to represent the Hamiltonian in second quantization. And to do that, I will motivate the subject by considering the following aspect. If you have in classical fields for first quantization, first quantization, you have something like this. Psi projected out to the Hamiltonian. Psi could be any other operator, but suppose the Hamiltonian. This is the average of the Hamiltonian given the state. So average here. Of the operator of the Hamiltonian, for instance. This is a number, a real number. Okay? Because the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator. If if you consider any other kind of operator here, which is a non-physical observable, for physical observables must be real. 
but for non-physical, for non-observable, sorry, it could be anything, a complex number. But this is average. What is it for a second quantization? What is it? What replaces, what replaces the averages here? This kind of average, of course. And, and this is some kind of operator. It must be some, some kind of operator because it's second quantized. It must be a function of annihilation and creation operators, all right? For free particles, just number operators, perhaps. You can find a basis where number operators emerge, right? But for interacting fields, you'll find out an operator corresponding to the, of course, the interactions and, and the number of particles and the interactions between them, which can create, annihilate, and all that. Okay, so in next lecture, we'll discuss this, these things here, how to represent the Hamiltonian of a system as a second quantized operator. To finish here, just notice that first quantization, you are, you are working with a single particle, okay? You are describing your, your particle, which is subjected to something, but usually, usually you are working with one particle system. When you go to a second quantized version, of course, you could, you could try to represent things in the first quantized version for many particle systems, but you get in trouble, into trouble because you need to, to take care of the spin statistics theorem. And the second quantization is a natural way of dealing with systems of many particles obeying the correct spin statistics, which in some cases are fermions, in some cases are bosons, and in the end, they will interact. Bosons and fermions will interact, okay? So a second quantization is a quantum version, usually. It is a quantization of fields, but is, since a field can be thought of as being a system of many particles, infinite number of particles, so when you second quantize, when you quantize a field, as a matter of fact, it is just like you are trying to work with many particle systems. You are just quantizing a, in a natural way or in, a, in an efficient way. I don't know if it's natural, but it's, in, it's efficient. It is relatively easy to work with many particle systems, okay? So in the next lecture, we will do that for the Hamiltonian. We will see what happens for interacting systems, the next lectures, perhaps. And I, I hope you, you could understand what I was trying to bring to you in this lecture. See you next time.